It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 117, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today, Jason Weston, is a co-owner of Joe's Gardens in Bellingham, Washington, a five-acre urban farm started in the 1890s. I didn't say that wrong. I've said the 1890s. One of the last of the original truck farms in the Bellingham area, Joe's Gardens sells almost all of its produce retail on site now. Jason has become well-known for his innovations with the Planet Junior two-wheeled cultivating tractors that he uses for weed control on his farm, and he provides an introductory tutorial into their features and uses and how they changed everything for Joe's Gardens. We dig into how the two-wheeled tractors support his intensive no-bed production and into the modern weed control tools that he has used to almost eliminate hand weeding on his farm. We discussed how Joe's Garden is laid out to maximize space utilization and the tillage and production practices that support that layout. Jason also shares how he and his forebears have managed fertility in a continuous vegetable rotation for over 120 years and the long-term approach that Jason takes to managing soil health. We also discussed the changes in Joe's Gardens marketing over the years as the wholesale and retail marketplaces have shifted in product demand and consumer attitudes. Joe talks about the challenges they faced in shifting to a retail operation and the family dynamics that helped make that shift successful. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company. Founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. And by CoolBot by Store It Cold. You can build an affordable walk-in cooler powered by a CoolBot and a window air conditioning unit. Save up to 83% on upfront costs and up to 42% on monthly electrical bills compared to conventional cooling systems. Jason Weston, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me on. I've always kind of wanted to be on this show. That's great because ever since I saw you first showing some of the videos of what you were doing with the two-wheeled tractors that we're going to talk about a little bit later, I said, wow, I got I to gotta talk to that guy. So it's a, I'm glad that you're glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, no, this, is, this is fun. Exciting. So, Jason, could you start off by kind of setting the stage for us there at Joe's Gardens? Where are you guys located? How many acres are you farming? How are you selling your vegetables? Kind of all of those details. Well, I'm in Bellingham, Washington. Name of the farm is Joe's Gardens, and we are farming uh, – under cultivation, we have five acres with about another acre of buildings, greenhouses, storage, what have you. So totally, we have about six acres that we farm on. Mostly just mixed vegetable crops, uh, more than I can even think of right now. Then we also do uh, a big nursery production for wholesale and retail. And we're mostly, nowadays, we're a retail store for our vegetables more so so than wholesale like we used to do years back. So most of your stuff is being sold right there on site. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, it, with the vegetables, probably 99.9% of it's all sold on site. We have a, we do a few wholesale grocery stores still just to keep our uh, foot in the door because you never know what the future is going to bring. So you got to make sure you stay you know, in contact with everybody. And then we have restaurants that we sell to, but we don't deliver to them. They have to come and pick it up because it's just, you know, there's just not enough volume to make it worth our time anymore that like we used to do back 10, 15 years ago. And when you say that you're in Bellingham, Washington, you guys really are in Bellingham, Washington. I mean, I lived in, in Bellingham for about five months back in 1997. And I remember distinctly walking by your farm there in the middle of the city and it's not your typical urban farm. I mean, you guys are, I mean, you guys are, you're right there and it's a, and with five acres, you guys are real. I mean, I don't want to no no disparaging to, to other urban farms, but you guys are what you look like a farm. You know, you didn't look like a big garden. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We're definitely in the middle of the city now. You know, on one side is all apartment buildings and across the street is all housing and interstate five and, On the other side is a big housing development, and we're only two minutes from a shopping mall, and up behind the house is a high school. 
Like, yeah, we're, we're surrounded. We're definitely surrounded. And, you know, back in the day, you know, the farm itself was started originally in the 1890s, somewhere in there. We're not exactly sure on the exact date by the Robertson family. And they farmed it all the way up into the mid 30s. And that's when Joe bought it. And there's a whole history with Joe and him too the, for the farm. And, you know, it's still pretty much county even back in the 40s, you know, in this area. But then it slowly started to urbanize and be built up all around here. And now we're, we're definitely in the city, which is great for business. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to complain about that at all. So Joe buys it in 1933, but you're not actually related to Joe, are you? No, Joe had uh, no kids, him and his wife, Anne. And the way it kind of worked, well, Joe was born in San Francisco. And his parents, uh, right after he was born, well, his mother got sick, and they went back to Italy. And they lived in the Genoa area. And so he stayed there till he was 17 years old. Working on the family farm there, which had been there, what he said, hundreds of years, you know, just passed on from generation to generation. And but when he turned 17, either he had to join the Italian military. And this was back in 1921, I think, and, or he had to come back to America so he didn't lose his citizenship. Well, he had an uncle that was already farming here in Bellingham. So he hopped on the boat, came back to the United States, and started working on his uncle's farm down on Iowa Street, which is just a few miles from here. They had a 15-acre farm down there, and he just kind of took it over from his uncle at that point. And they farmed there for a lot, a lot of years. But back then, that whole area used to flood every spring, so they were never sure how their spring crops were going to make it, if there's going to be a huge flood and they lose everything, or if they're going to be able to make it through the spring and so he started looking for another farm and that's when he found this place over here that we're at now and for a lot of years he farmed this five acres plus the 15 acres down there and that was mostly with horse back in those days horse and plow and so they just run the equipment back and forth and then the way it came from there is in the 1958 my father came down here and started working for Joe, and he loved it. He absolutely loved this business. And he kept working here on and off for at least another 20 years or 10 years, somewhere in there, until the mid 70s. And so during that time, my father also got married to my mother, and he went into the boat building industry. And we also had other nurseries when I was growing up. It's all stuff that's hard for me to remember because I'm getting too young for this point. I was born <laughs> in 72. And, but long story short, in 1983, uh, Joe called up my dad and said, hey, I'm ready to sell. And this is when Joe was 76, he's still running the farm. So my dad sold his boat company and we moved to a farm. And it was kind of funny because when we bought the farm, I was only 11 years old. I had no idea that we bought the farm. I didn't even know where we were in Fairhaven because at this point I was growing up out in the Ferndale area. And so we took this over to kind of a, I started working here at 11 and just kind of really fell in love with it. And luckily for me, you know, my, I'd been gardening most of my life at that point, you know, not commercially or professionally, but my dad always had huge gardens. But I got to work with Joe till he's 96. He worked here for another 20 years. And two days before he died, he was still working out in the field. One day he didn't come to work. He was sick. And the next day he was gone. But, you know, I was really, really fortunate to have all those years of uh, learning from someone who did truck farming and commercial agriculture on a small scale his whole life to teach me the skills that I kind of lost over the years. We're kind of one of the last original truck farms in our area. Yeah, I mean, you guys again. And you say when you say truck farm, you guys really are the model of doing that. That five acres of vegetables on the edge of the city. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just you know, not well, we still are, but you know, it's always about production, production, production. The amount of stuff product we can put out of this five acres is is mind blowing, but that's just the way it was always done, you know? 
just, you know, back in the day, it was, we were doing uh, 12,000 heads. Of, we always use lettuce as a, a major around here, but like we do 12,000 heads of lettuce every two weeks. And back then, it was mostly using manure for fertilizer. So you'd spread your chicken manure, rototill it under, plant your lettuce. And as soon as that crop was finished, it was tilled under, manured, and planted again. You'd, the ground and basically never sat empty. It just was work, 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 and it's been that way for the last 120 years about. Just never stopped. Now, that must create some interesting challenges for you, and you talk about doing that for 120 years of, of straight vegetables because that's I, – when I, when I think about market farms, most of the people that I've had on the show, you know, their land hasn't been in a vegetable rotation for 120 years. What are you guys doing to maintain fertility? Oh, uh, well – we had issues about, oh, 25 years ago from all the years of using just basically manure. Eventually, the, the phosphate level started to get so high, it started to kill stuff. And so we had to quit using manure for a long time because we, we were adding stuff we didn't need to get the stuff that we did need. And so we started doing soil pests 20, 25 years ago and brought in, you know, soil scientists to help us work it through. And basically it's taken us 20 years to bring our phosphate levels down. And, by, and we had to do that by using commercial fertilizer because we can't use the manure because that will keep on bringing up my phosphate levels. And so we just started using the nitrogen and we found out we we're completely depleted on iron. And so the, uh, Testing has just completely revolutionized our farming and our production. Just, I want to say the increase, but the quality increased so much because, you know, that many years without testing and just adding compost to manure, you can start getting a lot of imbalances that, you know, just don't know are happening. But over that grand of scale of time, you still, you start seeing issues. And to me, you know, short term is 10, 20 years. That's, Short term, the long game's 50, 60 years. So anytime I'm thinking about how to change my soil or improve my soil, I'm thinking, well, I got 20 years to get this done. So that's about what it takes to really, at least in my area, to get a good balance and stable soil. Now, in your advertising materials online, it says that you guys don't use any pesticides on your farm. Oh, we, in our fields, we haven't had any form of pesticides, synthetic or organic, and over 30 years and that's just by choice you know we just don't want to do it one we don't like it two you're in the middle of the city it just it doesn't fly you don't even, you don't, even if you want it to you don't really have a choice and so yeah we just made the decision and we started off with uh using remade you know 25 30 years ago is when we started using that and we the main bug issues we had eventually got under control and now it's just really not much of any issues anymore. You know, just, we don't have to use Rima anymore. We don't have too much of a bug issue though. We started getting flea beetle a couple years back when we started getting the drier weather here, but we found a solution for that by putting our uh, salad greens, which are the only thing they're really attacking inside of coal frames that have walls on them. And flea beetles just don't get into it. So we, we found a solution for that that was really easy for us. But just through keeping the soil tested, balanced, and, uh, you know, irrigation's a huge thing. Everything is really kind of balanced out. I mean, I'd like to say we did it, but who knows? It could just be luck, you know. I'm not going <laughs> to take credit for luck. Now, you mentioned irrigation. It, it actually reminds me that just a couple of days ago, you posted a, an article on your on your Facebook page saying that, uh, that Bellingham is – the place in the United States that actually gets the least sunshine during the year. Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I wasn't fully aware of that because I just, you know, seems sunny enough here to be. So yeah, that's kind of surprising that we only get sunshine 35% of the time, but you know, in the summertime, like last year, we didn't have rain from mid April till the end of September. And just, if we did have rain, it was a tenth of an inch here, a tenth of an inch there, but nothing that does any good in agriculture. So for us, irrigation is extremely important. And we've switched over in the past 10, 15 years to using irrigation reels that, you know, self-wind up. 
And so I got four of those. And so when it comes to irrigating, I can just go set my four reels up, turn them on. They'll, they'll come in at whatever speed I set them for and then shut themselves off, which frees up a lot of time for me for having to move irrigation. It takes 10, 15 minutes to move an irrigation reel and I'm done. But yeah, I was really kind of surprised by the cloudy thing too. But like I said, I've never lived anywhere else. So it just seems normal and it's just surprising what would everybody else be doing with all this extra sunshine? <laughs> you lose your sense of urgency to get out there and get working on stuff. <laughs> now, do you guys end up with extra disease and fungal issues because of the wet weather? No, no. They get very, there's very few diseases or anything like that, at least that I experience. I mean, when you get into September, October, you can start seeing like powdery mildew on your squash like zucchini, stuff like that. But by then you don't really care because the season's at an end, you're slowing down and you're ready to kill it anyway and take your vacation. So it's not a big deal. But other than that, you know, it's just when I joined these Facebook groups and started learning about what everybody else goes through in this country, it's, we're really, really blessed with the, how few diseases and insects we have over here on the West Coast. It makes farming pretty simple compared to what I've read it, what other people are having to go through. I grew up in Seattle. It's kind of a magical place over there west of the Cascades. And if, if they just got a little bit more sunshine and you could get rid of some of the people, it'd be a great place to live. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a double-edged sword, you know. You love having all the people for customers because it makes your business successful and it allows you to continue in doing what you love, but at the same time, it, it's a lot of people compared to what I grew up with, you know, and it's kind of like, wow, I'm not really used to that, and just kind of being a, a farm kid living in a city, it's just kind of, it's still kind of getting used to it, even after all these years, I'm just not really big in the cities, I mean, I, I rarely even leave Whatcom County that I live in, like going to Seattle might be a once a year or every other year, I'll make it that far down south. I just, I don't like the big cities. I just like to stay in my little corner of the world over here and hide and farm and have fun. How big of a town is Bellingham now? Well, that's funny you ask that. My wife and I were just looking that up after we read that article. It's now they say 85,000 people. Okay. I think back in the 1950s, it was 50,000. So it took us quite a few years to grow to this side. But most of the people now have moved out to the county. I think the total county population is somewhere close to two or 150,000. So your five acres, tell me about how that land is situated. Is it, is it a nice flat piece of ground? Is it I, I seem to, I kind of remember that it's got a, it's got a rise up on one end of it. I mean, it's funny how much this farm stuck in my head back in 1997 that I can still see it in my mind, but tell me a little bit about how that land lays and, and how you guys are farming it. Well, it's, uh, we're right in the bottom of a valley. So it goes, we have a low point down the center, then it has, goes up uh, an elevation, probably 10 feet. 15 feet on either side from the center. Then we have upper fields that are probably a good 15, 25 feet higher than the lower fields. And all the fields are pointed in the east-west direction for the most part. Some are pointed north-south just because of the lay of the land. But we have no real choice because it's farming more on hillsides. And we just kind of do everything on um, in rows. Um, our main standard row is a 15-inch. And we do some 30s, excuse me, and uh, we do 30-inch rows, 48-inch rows, and 60-inch rows, just depending on the crop. But our main standard is uh, is 15. It's just, I, just what Joe always did. And so that's what I do. You know, that's what my dad did. So it just, and it just so happened, I guess that is just a standard row crop measurement to find out later on. So when you say when you say you're doing everything in rows, are are those rows on bed tops or is that just row after row of vegetables across the field? Uh, for the most part, it's just row after row. I try to reduce any walkways or anything because our goal for most crops is everything come up perfectly even. 
and then we can just go out and clear cut. Now on crops like beets, leeks, chard, that are more selective harvest, you go out and just, you know, you got to pick and choose what you're getting. We'll leave like a 30 inch walkway for wheelbarrows and stuff to get through. And just for any debris, you know, ugly leaves and stuff that we just dump on the side. But most other crops, I like to just, you know, just one continuous field the whole way across and just not waste the space. And the other big areas I leave open would just be uh, about a 40 inch path for irrigation. And once I get those set, they pretty much stay in the same spot all season long. What kind of soils do you guys have there? We have um, kind of a clay loam soil here, glacial till. It's kind of a mix. I mean, you go to the bottom of our garden, like the word low spot, it's topsoil that goes five, six feet deep. You go up towards the ends, you will have topsoil that's um, 12 to 18 inches deep. It just it kind of varies because the way it works is you take uh, 120 years ago, the ground wasn't flat. It had little hills and hollows and that. And just over the last 120 years of plowing and rototilling and disking, it's flattened it out, but you still have those layers of clay from the original elevation. So you can go into the middle of the garden, you'll be on five feet of topsoil, and all of a sudden you'll be 12 inches down and there's clay, and you go another you know, 15, 20 feet, and you're back to three or four feet of topsoil. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. And then when we get to our upper fields, which are our newest fields, we've only been farming them for probably 25 years. Those are almost kind of a gravel. You know, they're just they're not very nice. We were, they were getting nicer and nicer over the years. And I suspect in probably another 30, 40 years, they'll be beautiful. But, you know, they'll take, it takes time. But for the most part, it's just the glacial till and um, clay loam. Yeah. You know, we're sitting on um, most of our fields are between 10 and 18 percent organic matter in the original uh, farm area. The newer fields, we are six to eight percent organic matter, but that's going to take, you know, 20, 30 more years to get stable organic matter up into the teens up here. But again, we're not going to, we don't want to put too much of anything on at one time because then you're going to slowly start throwing your stuff out of balance. So you just got to take your time and just do it right. Aim for the long game, not the short game. With your five acres, are you guys doing tillage operations with four wheel tractors or are you guys using two wheel tractors for that? Uh, both. You know, for the main tillage, you know, we plow every spring. And so we have an old 1955 Farmall 100 that we use for a plow tractor. And that's all it's used for these days. Back uh, years ago, Joe used it for everything with disc and harrow too. But I'm not. I don't know how really how to use that because no one ever taught me how to use those tools. And then after that, we just go through with a rotor tiller and just till the soil as needed. You know, you, you definitely don't want to over till, but you know, do it enough years, you kind of get a pretty good idea of what needs to be done. And then cultivating is all done by two wheel tractors. So you use my little Planet Juniors for that. And this is something that I want to spend some time on because I think these these two wheel tractors that you're using for cultivation are just fascinating to me. So can you, for somebody who hasn't seen the videos and, and keeping in mind that we're on radio, can you describe these tools for me? Yeah, the, the little two wheel tractors I'm using are Planet Junior variety. And it's something that was very popular from the 20s through I think the late 60s are very popular. And basically it is a like a imagine like a bcs tractor everyone's familiar with that but strip all the gear boxes out for the most part there are some with gear boxes don't get me wrong i'll just describe the planet juniors for now strip out all the gear boxes just put a lightweight engine on a lightweight frame that's just belt driven no power takeoffs or anything like that for the pto on the back end of it and so they're just they're a really light tractor the ones that i use and then on the back of that, they have what are just like a toolbar, like uh, like any three point, but these are just a single point uh, with a kingpin that hold them on. And you can choose a huge variety of different tooling to suit your needs for 
cultivating. And, you know, once you figure it out, uh, it just, if you can figure it, think it up, you can build it and you can use it. And it's, they're, they're really incredible machines. And the best part about them is they're fast. They're lightweight and extremely controllable. I mean, you can get right up next to stuff and, you know, just do perfectly straight rows with them. They're, they're incredible. That's all I could say. And it's basically a one row cultivator, right? You can do one row to multiple rows, up to five, six rows, depending on the size of cultivator you want to build for it and what type of cultivation you're doing. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I do. I just built a three-row finger weeder set up to cultivate three rows of crops at one time. Why a walking tractor instead of something like an Alice Chalmers G? For me, I'm too small. A, a Chal- an Alice Chalmers G is is a fairly big tractor, and I don't. If I want to use something like that, I have to give up productive farmland to have turnaround space for it, and it just it's too much. I don't want to give up the farmland just so I could turn a tractor around. And there's also the issue with the amount of time it takes to switch between one implement to another. So we're, you know, Alice Chalmers is going to be on bolting stuff and rebolting it and realigning it. Uh, Planet Junior has a single pin. You pull that pin out, you move the tractor over to your next toolbar, and total time, if you're really slow at it, might take you one minute to switch between your implement. I'm not knocking out you know, Chalmers tractors. Geez, are incredible tractors. And if I had land, I'd love to play with one. But for my situation, for my setup, the Planet Juniors are the only way to go. Okay, so these these little two wheel tractors, are you only using them for weed control, or do you guys do you use them for other situations as well? I pretty much use them only for weed control and cultivating between rows. Though, so like let's say um, I have a small area that I just finished a row of rat, two rows of radishes, and I want to get right back in there and feed it. Well, my tractor is too big to fit in there, and I don't really want to take a walk behind rototiller through it. I'll just throw on a deeper cultivating system and go out there and just prep that little, you know, anywhere from 18 inches wide to however wide you want. Uh, just go run through it, get it ready for reseeding, and just go seed again. So it, it can be used for a semi-primary tillage depending on your operation and how you have it set up but for me it's it's mostly a weed control tool and you know weeding is just you know for us is a huge 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 expense even before we started using the plant junior cultivators we were using the hand cultivators you know just a normal uh, wheel hoe and the old planet junior style then you know we'd have five, six guys out there all working a rows, just, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of rows to cultivate. And so you'd be out there for days doing that. And then you still have to come back and hand weed all this, all the rows. And so being able to use the Planet Junior power cultivator, basically, I we don't have to do any of that anymore. I just go out there by myself and I can do like a wheel, like a beat hoe setup. I can do three rows at a time. So to do 300 feet uh, rows are equivalent of 900 foot rows or row foot feet. It takes basically a minute, 20 seconds to do it. And you start doing that over your whole garden. And before you know it, the wheel hoe is kind of a thing of the past and you're just primarily using the two wheel tractors. And so the time savings and labor savings are just, unbelievable. Now you said that it's pretty easy to steer these, but I, it feels to me like when I, when I imagine using something like this, it, it feels to me like it would be hard to keep it going straight. No, the way the design, it, there's different ways to set them up, but Planet Junior really figured it out well. So the way they have it set up is you have your main tractor with the, um, hitch pin area that's more right in the center of the right between the wheels and then that hitch area goes back to your main toolbar your draw bar and then all your tooling either hooks to that or to trailing arms that come off of it then behind those they have what's called a gauge wheel that's hooked to a coulter or a disc blade rather than a wheel and those discs dig into the ground a little bit 
and they act like a rudder, whole track keeping that cultivator tracking straight. So all you're doing is basically looking ahead down your rows and just driving that track to straight. If your track, if your row veers off to the left or the right, you just follow it. And because you have those gauge wheels in the back that are acting like a rudder tracking that cultivator, it just follows that track that row perfectly. So it, it keeps it really, really easy. I mean, it, the, the secret to them is the gauge wheel or that coulter setup they have on the back. Without it, the cultivator is completely uncontrollable and you just make a huge mess out of everything. And that, that was a huge leap for me to learn how to use these. You know, my original Planet Junior tractor, my dad used it when he was a kid back in the 50s. He loved it. He, he used that every day for everything. Well, by the time I came around to farming in the 80s, we still had it. But I didn't understand how it worked. And the engine by then was old and it was a nightmare to get started. And so, I'd, you know, Joe and my dad had had me go out there and use it. And I was like, all these dang gauge wheel things are always in the way. So I'd lift them all the way up out of the ground and just have them hanging there. And I just started driving it down to the roads once I did get it started a half hour later. And the cultivator would just be swinging all over the place. And I was just like, this is stupid. And I'd abandon it and go get one of our just walk behind rotor tillers instead and use that. And plus, you know, when you're a little kid, the new cool tool is always a lot more fun to use to go out there and play on that than it is this old rickety 1950s, 40s thing, you know. So, but later on, when I was, this is probably five, six years ago, I started, when I started using my irrigation reels more, I had little riding lawnmower tractors to start pulling the irrigation around with. Well, one day I was like, well, I'm going to try hooking that little Planet Junior cultivator set up to the back of that thing. And so I put it on and started dragging it through with a little lawn tractor through the field. And I was like, wow, this thing's really incredible. And so my dad finally came out and goes, look, you got to use your gauge wheels to keep it tracking straight. And he goes, well, why don't you go put it on the other tractor? And I was like, because I hate trying to get the tractor going. He's talking about the Planet Junior. Right. And he goes, well, why don't you take it up to the mower shop and have them put a brand new mower engine on it? And I was like, that's kind of a waste of money. He goes, trust me. So I threw it in the back of our Zuzu picture delivery truck, hauled it up to Bellingham Mower and... They put a new mo engine on it. I brought it back, and now it starts every single time. It was amazing. And I started using it, and I was just like, holy cow. I figured out the gauge wheels. I started getting everything making sense on how this whole system worked. From that point on, I was, I was hooked. And then I found a Planet Junior catalog from the 50s. And it had pictures of the toolbar set, setups and what else you could do with this thing. And so I went and hired a welder to start building me toolbars for this. And then it just kind of the whole thing exploded to there where I became obsessed with them. And just I went out and bought a welder, learned to weld so I could build my own things. And it just, it was, ah, oh, what's the word for it? it? It changed everything on the way we farm. I mean, it just, Huge, huge. I mean, we figure now in the summertime, we're saving 500 bucks a week just in labor from just having the weed alone. So it, they're, I don't know, all I can say is the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me in small agriculture in my 34 years of doing this. That's a pretty big statement. It, it is. I mean, but it was, I can't even figure the word for it, but it was, it changed everything for us. I mean, it made vegetable farming so much easier and it gave me the ability to put rows closer and i could grow stuff cheap now because you know we also started hooking finger weeders onto them and with the ability not having to actually pretty much do any hand weeding anymore do the finger weeders behind these little tractors let's say i have a few extra feet and i want to try a new test crop i can just go out there seed it throw it in and if it doesn't work out, that's okay because I have, what, 10 minutes to get the soil ready with the tractor, 10 minutes to take the Planet Junior 300 seeder out there and seed two rows. Then I might have 30 minutes of cultivating time just as far as going through between the rows and finger weeding the rows for weeding. So I might have an hour of my 
actual time invested into this little teeny spot that would have been sitting empty otherwise. And I can test it. If it doesn't work, I'm out 20 bucks. I don't care. I'll just rototill it under and move on to the next thing. So it's the ability to test crops like that and plant stuff more efficiently. It's allowed us to expand the amount of stuff we grow because it's not the risk there isn't there and the cost isn't there anymore. Tell me about those finger weeders. Cause I mean, between the row weed control, no matter how you're doing it is, is well, I mean, that's the easy part, right? I mean, it doesn't always, it doesn't always end up being easy, but that's the easiest part. It's, it's the in the row stuff that really gets hard. Yeah. Yeah. The, it, exactly. The finger weeders were, you know, beyond the tractors, it what made the tractors the super machine beyond anything. So originally, we still had the tractors. We still had to go back through and hand weed. Well, on our, our farm groups on the Facebook pages, we've been discussing it, but no one could find finger weeders. And none of us really wanted to spend the money to test them. And then I found a company called Sutton Egg down in California, and they had a website where I could just buy finger weeders right off a web page. I didn't have to try and go through all these companies that didn't want to listen to me or hear from me because I was too small to buy, you know, a $30,000 cultivating unit. So I took a risk and spent the $400 and got my first set of little finger weeders. And I didn't, still didn't know what to think about them too much. They're going to be a test. You know, if they failed, well, they failed. If they, if they work like they say they're supposed to work, it's a game changer. And so that spring, which would have been last year, I took them out for the first time and they're, they're scary to use at first. So you have these little fingers or they're spinning at really high speed. I mean, they look really fast when you're using them. Right. You've got a standard that's coming, that comes down off of the toolbar and then it bends yeah. at maybe like a 45 degree angle. And then you've got a hub and this, and then a wheel with all of these rubber fingers on it. Is that we're that's, that's what we're talking about, right? Yep, that, that's exactly what we're talking about. Yep, is the and the little rubber fingers, or they have brushes you can put on them. And so you have these little metal teeth that dig down into the soil that spin the rubber fingers that are poking out from the sides of it in kind of like a star shape. And you go down right over the top of your rows, and these fingers go right into the root zones of the plants. And the idea is when you have your little weeds in there that's that are in a thread stage, they disturb the soil enough that these little weeds just die. And it works. It works incredibly well. And it took me a long time to build up the confidence to set them up right where the fingers are almost touching each other and you just go right down that row. And But once I figured it out and once I learned how to use them, it was the most incredible development on our farm in decades. I mean, it was basically the end of hand weeding for us. You know, it was just that incredible. And this, you know, so I started off with my little nine inch ones, was so impressed with them. I'm like, I gotta get the 13 inch too. So I bought the 13 inch and they were even more incredible than I got the brushes for doing small crops. And then I can go over little teeny seeded things like carrots and beets, spinach without pulling them out. And then it's just unbelievable. It was just really lucky that we had a company like Sutton Egg that was willing to deal with the little farmers like us and help us out and teach us how to use them and answer any questions because they're there really wasn't anybody around to help us with that. Sutton Ag's a pretty special company. They're, I mean, they've been somebody that I've dealt with off and on uh, for 20 years, and and uh, they're great. Yeah, I'm I'm very very impressed with their customer service and just they're taking the time to, you know, I'm not spending thousands of dollars. I mean, they sell huge equipment down there and stuff in here. I'm just going to go and spend, you know, say I want some brushes for my finger, but I'm going to spend a hundred and some bucks. And he's going to be willing to sit there on the phone with me for 20, 30 minutes and tell me how to set them up, how they work. That's incredible. You know, here they're dealing with huge, huge farms and yet they're willing to take time and talk to my little teeny place. You know, I, 
I respect a company like that. I love a company like that. What kinds of tips and tricks do you have for using those finger weeders? I can only speak for my soil at this point. I don't know how what sort of tips and tricks going to be needed on sand and and other crops or other types of soil. But for me, the one thing would just be bold with them. Just put them as close so the the fingers are just about touching, and get out there and just go for it. You know in it's scary, and it's going to take a while before you build up that confidence to actually just go out there and just say, this works. It's not going to hurt anything. My sphincter is clenching as you say this. I mean, I'm just like, that's got to take some guts. Yeah, and it's like, um, it's like anything. You know, it's like I was going through the beat, and for the first few times, and I was seeing a beat here and there get thrown out by him, and I was going, God, is this worth it? Is this worth it? And I'm thinking, well... If I was weeding these by hand, well, heck, you'd be throwing out tons of them, too. You'd go to pull a weed, and the beat comes with it. So I started thinking, well, you know, I'm losing a lot less beats like this than I am by doing it by hand. And it's the same thing with carrot. It's just like, at first, because it's something new, you're like, oh, my God, this isn't working right. And then you start thinking, oh, God, the other way is doing a heck of a lot more damage. And then you start realizing, well, okay, I just went and finger weeded 40,000 carrots and I killed 30 of them. Not a big deal. I would have killed probably four or 500 of them hand weeding. And if you're worried about it, you know, if you're really concerned about loss of your soil and stuff like that, feed a little extra. You can always kill them later. You know, it's, uh, but they do surprising little damage. I mean, they're kind of magical in a way. Now, certain crops like radishes and some of the salad mixes, they don't work on. They're too shallow rooted. They, the, the plants have to have a deep root. And transplants, they work beautifully on. You just go out and transplant like we do lettuce. We'll go out and transplant lettuce. And six, seven days later, I can go through and start finger weeding and killing any of the um, red weeds that are starting to come up. And whatever it does miss, it, you know, like let's say I have. Um, 1,200 row feet of spinach. Whatever if the finger weeders are missing, it might take me 20 to 30 minutes to go pull a few weeds that were missed, tops. Right. So you're just dramatic. I mean, even if you're not eliminating the hand weeding labor, you're dramatically reducing it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're talking like, let's say carrots. Hand weeding carrots for us used to take, let's say, a four-man crew to do uh, 1,200 row feet of carrots probably would have taken, as a group of four people, would have taken an easy 15 hours. And now you're taking that down to, you know, one person after the finger weeding's done, you know, one time during the whole planting might take 30 minutes. It's a huge difference. Well, yeah, and it, and it makes it a no-brainer to invest in that kind of equipment then even if it's a couple hundred dollars a piece. Well, it's like my parents and my brother and my dad. When I first started getting into this plant junior stuff and the walk behind tractors, at first they were kind of, they didn't like me spending so much money on these unknowns, you know? So I was buying all this different tooling. Anything I could find I could imagine that might work. I, I had to test it. And so I just, I had to take a chance. I remember they'd get so upset because they'd get this bill for three or four hundred dollars off of eBay for me buying different tools that I found on eBay. <laughs> it's, 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 it's worth it. It's worth it. Trust me. And soon enough, I'd get them running, and maybe half of them were worth the money, and the other half, basically, I gave away to somebody else to play with. But over the long game, now we have this system. That is just incredible. And I'm still buying tools to this day, testing out stuff. I mean, it doesn't even have to be Planet Junior. I, I just go through eBay, Craigslist, looking for any small scale, old school tools or even that I, can, that I can use that might be able to work to do something for somebody. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to work on my farm, but if I can find something that's kind of cool, post a video about it. Maybe somebody else will see it and go, oh, wow, that'll work for what I'm growing. You know, so it's kind of a community movement, too. But back to the original story now is 
No, no, my parents or my brother, none of them say anything about me buying stuff on the, for the planet. Juju. They're just kind of like, okay, it's probably a really good idea. <laughs> You're talking about this old equipment. I'm, and I, you know, this is one of these things and this happens periodically on the show. I'm like, where was this when I was farming? And, and, but I also think like, for me, the idea of, of buying an old piece of equipment and rehabilitating it wasn't exactly in my skill set. Is this something that's available? Are there newer versions of the power units available for these? Yeah, there is. Yeah, there's, there was hundreds of different walk behind tractors made for 50, 60 years. And there's lots, most of them are, are pretty good for what they do. You know, I, I can only speak for the Planet Junior because that's what I use, but there's like the Midland Simplicities. David Bradley's um, and umpteen tons of other ones out there that are just that will work and they can do the job. I stick with Planet Junior because it's what I know. It's simple because like I can go find an old Planet Junior tractor. Most of the wear parts on those old tractors were double sided, so if one side ever wore out, you can flip it over and it's brand new. These these things were made to last over a hundred years of use. I mean, they're incredible and super simple. In far as power, the new Briggs and Stratton motors actually have the same bolt pattern as the original Briggs and Stratton motors from the 40s and 50s and 60s. So you literally pull off four bolts, put your new motor on it, put them right in the exact same holes, they have a six to one gear ratio uh, gear reduction on the uh, side of it that lines up with all the original pulleys and drive system. And so you put your old pulley back on it, hook a throttle cable up to it, put a new belt on it, add some gas and oil and you're working. It, it's just really that simple. And there's other tractors out there like that that are simple too. I'm just not a professional. And there's guys and groups online that can really help out with that, that can make the choosing of what tractors to use and how to set them up a lot easier. Are there other tools that you found besides the spider weeders that are that are really valuable? Oh, God, yeah. Well, I guess well, it's everything, you know, every tool is valuable in its own way. It's just a matter of what works good on your farm. Like Haas makes a uh, a hoe, the, the, their stirrup hoe. And it's a cheap, easy solution to getting a multi-row cultivator on these tractors. They just, they bolt right on the clamps and you're right out there working in the field in no time. And it's available, it's new. You're not searching on eBay for weeks, months, years, looking for this one specific diamond in the rough tool sitting out there someplace. So there is, um, like Haas, they have their tool set up. They have beat hose you can use on the tractors. So that's really nice. And then there's a company now that's making clamps and gauge wheels for them. So we're starting to get a whole set of different parts available for these tractors to make putting them together and getting them running simpler versus the old days when you're checking eBay 10 times a day, looking for that one piece that you need so desperately. Now you can just go online or make a phone call and say, Hey, I need this amount of clamps. And within a few days are shipped, or I need gauge wheels and the ship and finger weeders, or you can call a pass. Hey, I need this type of hoe, or this type of replacement part. So as the groups and the, the amount of people using these tractors grows, it's becoming easier and easier within the community for everybody to find what they need to get their tractors going. When back when we originally started, when there's only three or four of us that were uh, testing these out and figuring out how to go, it could be really hard to find those parts that you needed. But now it's, it's pretty much a cakewalk and everyone's having a, a great time just being able to, you know, order what they need, build their cultivating setups and get right out there and start working. Awesome. Okay, with that, Jason, we're going to stop here, get a quick word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Jason Weston from Joe's Garden in Bellingham, Washington. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Store It Cold's CoolBot. Way back in 2000, the year that I started Rock Spring Farm, the manager of the local food co-op complained that the lettuce from the local producers lasted for days in her cooler. 
while the lettuce from California lasted for weeks. So what's that about 2,000 miles fresher? I later found out that none of the local growers had a walk-in cooler at that time. 17 years later, this is still the number one complaint I hear from produce buyers. You have to get your produce cold. The difference between then and now is that now there's CoolBot. You can build an affordable walk-in cooler powered by a CoolBot and a window air conditioning unit, saving up to 83% in upfront costs and up to 42% on monthly electricity bills compared to conventional cooling units. Use the code FTF at checkout to double your CoolBot warranty at no charge. Store it cold. Com. Perennial support for the Farm to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled jobs that we simply couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. And we're back with Jason Weston from Joe's Garden in Bellingham, Washington. So, Jason, how are you getting your seeding done then? Is that is that something? Are you actually putting the seeders on the back of these two-wheel tractors as well? I haven't tried that yet. I have all the, the equipment for the multi-row seeder that can go on the back of them. And they were available. I mean, they were very popular back in the day. But I haven't taking the time to get mine up and running yet. I use just the, the push version, the Planet Junior 300 uh, single row seater. And I love that. It's just something I grew up with. The ones we have down here have been down on the farm since the 30s or, you know, they're going on 80 years old and still work perfectly every day. You know, those things have literally seeded hundreds and hundreds of millions of seeds and still have yet to miss a beat after all these years. When I uh, seed, to make cultivating work properly on multi-row cultivating with tractors, you want your rows to be spaced properly. And then when one row curves, you want all your rows to curve. So I use uh, what we've always used, which is these uh, row markers that are basically, you could say it's like a giant rake that's six, seven, eight feet wide with uh, just wood spikes that come down to say if I'm on a 15 inch row, every 15 inches would be a wood stake that comes down. And then I just lay a string out in the field from one end to the other. And then I just go out and pull the rows all six at a time. And by doing more rows than that, I just turn around and follow the sixth row back down with the uh, marker and just will mark out all our rows that way. So everything comes out the same distance apart. So when I go out there with my tracker, everything is set right. And I don't have to worry about rows going in or out or back or forth. I just have the same distance every single time. How are you doing your transplanting? Is, is that, I mean, obviously for, for the kind of system you've got, I mean, I say obviously, but it doesn't seem like you'd be using a transplanter for that. No, we do all our transplanting by hand. It's, it's easy, you know, it's, uh, yeah, the transplanting tractors and, and automatic transplanters, they're just, they're too big and take up too much space for us. So we just, you know, we'll have like uh, certain, some people dropping plants in front of us on the rows, and then we'll have people just bent over with hose, including me, just sitting there planting away. But like a five, six man crew, we can do, say, 6,000 heads of lettuce in 45 minutes. So it doesn't take that long. And for us, it's, it's not always about what's the easiest way to do it. It's generally always about what's the fastest way to do it. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a fine line there between ease and speed. And if trying to make something easier takes you longer when you're a small truck farm, that doesn't pay. You got to go for speed over ease any day. Who do you guys get for labor on the farm? 
Oh, for labor, we have well, my wife and I, my brother and his wife, and my mom and dad. And then we'll have, depending on the season, about uh, 13 to 15 other employees beyond that. And we have, for our field work, it's a three-man crew 99% of the time. It's me and Lori and Wilbur, which are our husband and wife team that have been working for us for years. And so three of us can take care of the fields, and everybody else during the summertime is store crew and wash crew. And if there's times like when we when you go out and transplant a whole bunch of lettuce, then I'll grab some of the store crew, bring them out for an hour or two, and we'll get projects like that done really fast. Then my parents are here during the springtime during the nursery season. That's just one of the most hectic times of the year. That's that's the hard part. The garden part's the easy, fun part. And then during the summertime, they take up on their sailboat and go sail out in the San Juan Islands all summer, and we pretty much don't see them. But it's, yeah, it's just mostly, um, you could say, tops will have 20 people down here in the springtime. And it'll drop down to more like 15 during the summertime when we're just doing crops and store work. Tell me a little bit about how your year goes there on at Joe's Garden. Because Bellingham, Washington, I mean, it's it's not exactly mild in the wintertime. But you guys are, you're way north. And it is pretty mild. Yeah. So. Well, the way we start is December 15th is our first day of spring. That's when we're down to greenhouses, and we will start planting for uh, nursery crops like pansies, herbs, uh, different onions, parsleys, and crops like that. And then we'll also be starting to seed our leeks and onions for out in the field. And then when you start getting into January, then you start getting into, that's when we'll start seeding lettuces and different uh, peas and miscellaneous wholesale crops. And we'll do a few things uh, for the garden too. And then usually in January, February, we always, typically we'll always get a week of nice weather, but some northeasters blowing, I'll dry the ground out. And we'll get out there and we'll get our garlic planted. We always plant garlic in the spring. And then we'll get out there and do their January, February and at the same time and try and get some carrots and beets seeded out in the fields. And then it's kind of on hold for a little bit till March as far as field work. The greenhouse work just continues on. We do hundreds of thousands of pots and millions of seeds a year on the nursery part. But that's an entirely different business from the uh, the garden part. And but. March 1st, typically, depending on the weather, can vary back and forth a few weeks. We'll get out there and start planting our first field lettuce and seed some uh, more beets, more carrots, some spinach. And usually, depending on the weather, too, we'll go ahead and transplant our uh, leeks and shallots and um, green onions and a few miscellaneous other crops here and there to, and peas. We do lots of peas, and then we kind of go back into being focused on the uh, greenhouse operations and the store operation because that's that's the big business. And then, but after that, after March, it becomes an every two weeks we will have like lettuces we have to plant, and other crops will be weekly having to reseed, and it just becomes a you know the beast that it is for the rest of the season. The nursery part goes till about May 15th, as far as feeding inside the greenhouses and planting. And then right then and there, it's pretty much done with for the season. And then we're primarily focused by June. It's all garden. Everything is about the farm itself. And we just keep that going all season long until October. And usually the second week of October, we just shut her down. We, uh, any crops left in the field will typically go to the food bank if they don't sell. And we plant all our cover crops, close the doors, and go home for the season. Huh. So you guys aren't doing any winter production? No. No, it's, it's too hard on the soil to be doing winter production in this area, especially with our soil. You just 
you're going out there making a mud pit out of everything and you know it's just not worth it anymore we used to you know back in the day when we were more of a wholesale farm it was a 365 day operation but back then our store was teeny you know we you know, we had six parking spots and if we saw six cars in the in the gar- in the parking area we'd have the whole field crew and everybody running in to help inside the store now we have 50 parking spots and 15 people working in a store at you know over the week and field crew we don't even look at the store anymore but you know back when we we're doing the wholesale that's just that's just where the money was and that's where we uh focused on everything how did that change for you guys? How did you move from from being primarily a wholesale operation into being almost exclusively retail? Well, it, it's just as the market changed. Um, you know, for a long time, you know, grocery stores didn't have the bag lettuce. They didn't have the organic lettuce. And so you just had produce in the grocery store. And so if you were a local supplier, you know, we were shipping out, you know, hundreds of cases every other day of, of product. So like one grocery store might order as much as, you know, a hundred cases of lettuce every other day. Well, as the produce industry changed and we became, you know, the produce department got divided, first of all, into uh, organic and non-organic. And then it got divided again to, you know, your pre-made salads and your um, non-organic and your organic. So you're basically taking that same produce space and divide it into three different areas. And so you go from, you know, selling hundreds of cases to where it literally went down to 10 cases every other day to the same store that used to buy, you know, 100 cases every other day. Even though the prices of all the products went up, the volume drops so much that it just no longer became worth our time anymore to do it. And so we just quit focusing on the wholesale and just switched over to focusing on to our retail business instead. And how did you do that? I mean, you guys were, I mean, you've been located in the middle of the city for 120 years. I would think that a retail operation would have been a no brainer from the get go. You would think it would be, but it, it just, it took that whole local movement. The local by local movement is really what gave us the ability to change. And the kind of the foreign tourism gave us the ability to to change our, our structure of how we did stuff. I mean, before people weren't really that interested in coming to the garden, you know, it's just the farm. They're just a different generation of people, you know, they grew up with farms all over the place. But as the younger generation started coming on and started taking over buying groceries, you had this movement where they wanted their kids to see a farm. Well, by now, there's just none, none left around. And so this became more of an experience for people. And so it just, everything at the time, you just worked out great. As the wholesale businesses started to die out, the local movement started to catch on. And so we're just like, well, we, we cut down from growing, you know, 12,000 heads of lettuce to every other week to 4,000 heads of lettuce to 6,000 every other week, depending on the season. And then we started diversifying into a lot more like salad mixes and mustards and miscellaneous other crops just for fun just to see how we did with those. And so we were able to offer a larger diversity of stuff inside the store, which made it more attractive to people. And we started opening up seven days a week. And, you know, with the community support and with us being able to offer more stuff and not being so focused on the, the wholesale, it just it worked out. And just lucky timing. So 10 years earlier, it probably wouldn't have worked. You farm with your brother, right? As well as your parents. I mean, you said your parents are off of the farm for a large portion of the summer now, but you've got family around you all the time. Yeah. How does that work? It's awesome. I mean, growing up, my brother worked at the garden for five years when he was a kid and left the farm to go do other things. And he moved to Seattle for about 20 years, but I really kind of liked it, enjoyed it and stayed on. But working for your parents, as anyone that has ever worked with family knows is a nightmare, but you can learn to make it work. And 
you know, my dad and I always had a really good thing with my mom and I. We could argue and fight like hell at the garden, but when six o'clock came around and we were done for the day, he left it behind. He just didn't even think about it. You have to be able to forgive, forget, and never hold a grudge. Grudges will get you nowhere in a family business. You just let it just roll off your back. It's not a big deal, you know. And so, but that going for, and we all had that kind of that same mentality. It just, it just allowed it to work. There wasn't that frustration. There wasn't that, oh, is they going to bring that up today type mentality. And so, you know, you just forgive and forget. No biggie. It's just business, as they say. And so that that's really what made it work very well for us. And then when my brother came back um, in 2007, I think, no, 2006, somewhere back in there, when he came back, when I was finally taking over the farm for my parents, the farm was too big of an operation for my wife and I to operate on our own. We had the wholesale plant business, which is a beast. We have the garden, which, you know, takes a lot of knowledge to do. And then there's the retail store, which is a heck of a lot to do. And then there's just the running the day-to-day business, which is a heck of a lot to do. And so when the time came, I just was like, I need somebody to help me. And there's only one person that I know that, like my dad, and it's like the ultimate businessman ever, was my brother. So I, my dad and I called my brother and said, hey, do you want to quit your high-paying job in Seattle and come take over here? And he was like, heck yeah. He was just having a kid. <laughs> and so he wanted to get to a simpler life. He was a salesman and traveled all over the U.S. and was gone for a long period of time. And it ended up working out wonderfully and so his wife and um nathan and his wife peg both work here and my wife and i both work here and the way we set it up i farm i grow everything i maintain almost everything i am your basic general farmer my brother he runs a store he concentrates on selling everything making sure all the wholesale business runs smoothly for for the plant and he does all the the background work, all the advertising and dealing with taxes and, you know, the day-to-day not fun playing with tractors business part of it. So but it, it ended up working really good. And at first when my brother came down here and started working in the store, oh, my dad and mom and I were just kind of like, what the heck are you doing? That's not how you do it. You know, because we were setting our ways on how we set up that store, how everything was in its place. It just, oh, it drives me nuts. It, but it, in the end, sales went up, productivity went up. I had to shut up. And so it worked really good. And now he runs all that. I get to go out and play in my fields all day and be Mr. Farmer. And he can be Mr. Businessman slash farmer salesman. And so it was a win-win for everybody. What kind of changes did he make in the store? Um, mostly it was he started to, one, he set up displays different. You know, we were always very particular on how the displays were set up. He made sure there was always customer service available. Before, when my dad, my, my mom and I, and my wife ran it, customers were kind of a side note because we were more of a wholesale operation. So... We just kind of left it, well, when you're ready, just come find us. We'll be out in the greenhouse or we're out in the field, you know, during the springtime. You know, in the summertime, there's a little bit more attention to detail. But he just made it more of a professional operation. He made sure there's always someone there to help, that they were well-trained and knowledgeable about the product. And he also started bringing in other products, more product than we did from other farms. They've always brought in stuff like berries from Berry Farms and apples and stuff from Apple Farms. But... He started bringing in like the honeys, jams. He got bread companies, all local companies to bring stuff in. And um, he, you know, just kind of just made it like a more of a, not so, I should say one stop shop, but it made it worth people's time to be able to come down there two or three, four days a week and shop rather than just that novelty stop place. It's like this year we're going to try and see if we can start carrying milk and eggs and. It's not about the profit of it. It's about 
making it easier for the customer because you know when you start getting into retail the customer is king and if you don't do what the customer wants, well, you're not going to be in business long. I think that's one of those things that it's like, it's so obvious that you almost feel like it shouldn't have to be said. But I think whether you're, whether you're looking at farmer's market or CSAs or doing it wholesale or doing it at your farm stand, it's really easy to forget where you have to put your customer, what it really means to put your customer first. Oh yeah. They're the ones buying from you. I mean, if you're growing some magical thing that nobody else in the world grows or produces, sure, you can do whatever you want and treat people every once so long as they want it. But when you're doing and selling the same stuff that everybody else is selling, you got to make sure that they are happy and they are number one and they're your number one concern. If you don't do that, you're not going to be in business long. And, you know, that's the thing too. you got to remember farming is a business above anything else. If you go on this as, kind of a, oh, it's a back to nature, this, that. It, it, you can be successful, but you're going to have a hard time on it. It's just, you've got to have the business mentality on it. Be, you know, truly successful at it for most times. You know, and our focus too is we try and provide produce that everyone can afford. It's always been very important to the farm when Joe owned it. It's always important for him to provide produce that's affordable to everybody. They grew up dirt poor, starved, literally starving to death at times when they're younger. And so having food for everybody was always very important for them. And same with my parents, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, money wasn't as plentiful as it is today. And so it's always very important for them to provide, you know, affordable product. And with the style of farming we're doing where, we learned to farm to do wholesale, you could say mass production on a small scale, but that's how we do it and with a focus on maintaining the soil health and everything. But we know how to produce large quantities efficiently, which keeps our prices down, which is good for the customer. You know, it makes them happy. I'm still making plenty of money. They're not having to pay in an arm and a leg. So it's it's a win-win for everybody. And so having that experience of being a wholesale farmer, working to, you know, back in the day, you're talking a case of lettuce was four and a half dollars a dozen. And you made good money, you know, selling 12 heads for four and a half bucks. <laughs> you know, and even back in the 80s, we're only getting, you know, $6 for a case of 20, a case of 24. And we still made a really good living at it. So with just that knowledge and that skill set to be able to produce stuff at a higher volume efficiently transfers into savings for our customers. So, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. Now, we talked about one specific tool that you're using, the, the two-wheel tractors and the weeders on those to, to help you meet that efficiency to keep your prices down. Mm -hmm. Is there a key to producing a large volume of produce on a small acreage? I mean, what what is your magic sauce? Motivation. Just motivation. Um, I was trained to do everything fast. Everything you could say is almost a race. I truly believe in working with your employees. You don't go sit up in an office or go do something else you are the one that set the pace. You're the one that has the knowledge, the speed to teach them. So you should be there as much as you possibly can working side by side to set that pace until they learn it and appreciate the reasons behind it. And I just, I really think that's one of the most important things is always be on site with them. That's what helps us being, having my brother to do the store and me to do the farm is we can separate those duties where by myself, I kind of be in the store and in the bar or out in the field at the same time, setting paces and teaching people constantly. And, you know, it's, um, it, I don't know. I just, I guess I'd say it's just, it's not dilly dallying. You're, you're at your farm, you're there to work. You got to treat it as your job. You know, it's just a business to me. You know, it's more to me deep inside. I love farming. I love growing stuff. I love everything, but, it's a business first and I have to treat it that way. 
So everything has to be efficient. You always got to be constantly looking for ways to make things more efficient. Like for us, when we're planting those five acres, typically the whole farm on average gets planted three times a year. So we can produce as much off those five acres as say a 15 acres of land would. And it's just about when one crop's done, that next crop is in there within a day or two, if not the same day. We're just turnover, 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 speed, speed, speed. And it goes back to what I was saying originally about it's not what's easy, it's what's fast that makes the difference. I was, I, mean, I could go get a transplanter and sit on the tractor and do those two rows, or I can bend over and just get those plants in there so fast as blinding, you know. I think with that, Jason, we're at a good spot here to stop and turn to our lightning round, which we're going to do right after we get a quick word from one more sponsor. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast and this lightning round is brought to you by Vermont Compost Company, makers of living potting soils for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant materials, labor, heat, and overhead depend absolutely on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do. Produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients I could to make my own potting soil, and later on finding cheap potting soil that was already put together. But I found out what so many farmers have, that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants. VermontCompost.com All right, so Joe, what's your favorite tool on the farm besides the Planet Junior weeders? Oh, it has to be my Kubota tractor. I mean, I know it's modern and all that, but I I love tractors. I love pushing dirt. I love everything about the soil. It's just that's been a passion of mine since I was a little kid. What kind of Kubota tractor do you have? Right now I have a, my main tractor is a Kubota B3030. And then I have an old B7100 from that Joe bought back in the 70s for, a, we use now for a carrot digger. And then I have a little Kubota G4200 I use for pulling irrigation around. Now, as we've had our conversation today, it sounds like you've been on the farm forever. Did you ever leave the farm? And if you did, why did you come back? Well, I left the farm when I was 17 because I was smarter than everybody else on the planet at that point. And I had to go out and, you know, stake my stake in the ground and show what I could do in the world. And so I left and I worked in construction at a few different places. I did restaurant work and I did all types of different things. And I left the farm in May of that year. And by, I think, uh, July, I was back at the farm and I asked my dad, I want my job back. And he just looked at me and smiled. So you can apply for work next year. <laughs> and I had an epiphany that moment. I was like, oh my God. Well, I guess my dad's a dang good teacher. He's teaching me either you stick with something or you just face the consequences. But it's at that point, you know, I did ever reapply the next year and got my job back. But I knew from then on that I wanted to be a farmer. I love it. Everything about farming I love. I love the challenges. I like, it's even the repetitive parts of it. It's just all around my passion, my every waking moment, everything I think about is farming and something to do with farming. And, you know, even when I was 20 years old, I gave up mountain biking. I gave up skiing, gave up every sport that I could thought I could hurt my body on because I knew I was doing this the day I die. And just focused on low impact sports like fishing and hunting just to save my body for the next, you know, 70, 80 years of work ahead of me. And, you know, it's really kind of interesting. An old guy that comes down here all the time, he goes to me the other day, he goes, you know, young people have got to stop and realize they got to save something for when they're older. And I think I was really lucky to learn that lesson early from Joe and my dad about saving your body for what you really want to do in life especially if you're going to be a farmer and you love it, you better have something left over when you're in your sixties and seventies. What's your favorite crop to grow? Lettuce. 
absolutely love lettuce. It's something I've always been passionate about. It's, it's an easy crop to grow for the most part, at least over here it is. But at the same time, it can be very challenging. And I like to get it so every head comes up perfectly even with the next one, which isn't as easy as it sounds, but it's, it's definitely my favorite. And what would your brother say is your farming superpower? Wow, I think you would just definitely have to say probably uh, my farming superpower, just creating new tools to make jobs easier. Endlessly just figuring out something different or a new way to do something. Or just the fact that I have years of experience and know how to do things the old ways too if we need to. And finally, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Figure out how to use that dang plant junior walk behind. It will save you years and years of heartache <laughs> and extra work. So listen to your dad. Listen to Joe. When they say it's a great tool, screw playing around with the little planet, or the, um, the Troy built and BCSs and all the other little walk behind rotor tillers. Get that dang tractor running and learn to weld. Go and learn to weld. That's exactly what I'd say. Jason, thank you so much for a really informative and fun conversation today. Really glad that, that we could get together. Yeah, thank you. I had a I had a great time. This is fun. I mean, we could probably go on for another two or three hours the more I think about stuff to talk about, but maybe another day. All right. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 117 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast, and then you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Weston. That's W-E-S-T-O-N. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America, and by Rock Dust Local, the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. Additional funding for transcripts provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education, to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. Transcripts for every episode are available on the website. You got to just search for the, the episode page for the episode that you want. And we're working on backfilling the first hundred episodes with transcripts as well. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmer to farmer podcast.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes. Leave us a review if you enjoy the show. Talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource that you value. You can support the show by directly by going to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmer to farmer podcast.com. And I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.